and welcome to our time. Great to have your company in this episode once again because have you ever been fishing on the internet? No, I can't say that I have. Do you know there are so many nasty people fishing on the internet because they're mostly scams. Fishing is spelled P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. Oh, that's what you meant. Not the one, other one. Who okay. else is on today's program? John Grokey. He uh, has been on our program um, before, a few times actually, and he is our financial advisor. That gives and us lots he, of good... He does actually, and here's a really important question. What is going to happen when we run out of food? because running out of food is a very likely thing that could well happen. And we have Associate Professor Kerry Wilkinson with us. Kerry, welcome to our time. Thank you very much. To help me. answer that question. Kerry, that's the question. And we're not talking about just running out of food in your pantry. No. We're actually talking global, aren't we? we with are. the population of the planet growing so quickly, and with the protein that all human beings need to eat diminishing and the concern of animals causing environmental damage and so on, what do you think is the answer? Because this is your specialty, isn't it? It is. It's one of my areas of research. So one of the studies that we're looking at at the moment is the viability of edible insects as a new and novel protein source. Novel. For, <laughs> definitely novel. Um, protein source for consumption um, within Australia and, and also around the world. Well, because there are countries that are already eating insects quite Quite That's right. right. Um, insects are part of the traditional diets in in many countries. So throughout Africa, South America, and, and Asia, it's it's quite common, but uh, not so common and, and popular here in in the Western Western diets. You've tried it, haven't you? You have tried. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I've, I've eaten. I've just remember. I've eaten witchetty grubs, and uh, and I've actually eaten them raw, but I've eaten them cooked or you know done with something else. And meal meal worms, that was they call mealy worms. Meal worms, yeah. Meal worms. And oh other stuff. But we're Snake talking about stuff. Cockroaches and yeah, so other. we're talking commercially available now. You, you have got crickets and mealworms, but also cockroaches. Um, so there are a range of, of different edible insects that are out there. So these are the sort of insects. Uh, we can have a look at some of them. Um, some of the insects that we can actually eat. So this is who's this looking uh, like they're researching very cleverly here. Uh, so this is my honours student, uh, Crystal Bowden, who's working on this this project with me and. I um, in our sensory lab um, tasting cockroaches, crickets and mealworms. But you were saying too that you're, it's like with garlic and chilli and it's <laughs> That's right. So one thing we're interested in, you know, we, we sort of think about insects and, and you're thinking about what you'd find if you were having a bit of a dig around in the backyard. So that's absolutely not what we're talking about. No. These are these are insects that have been farmed commercially. What's she eating here about to? This is a cockroach. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that's dressed with something, isn't it? Well, here it's just a roasted cockroach. Roast. Oh, roast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Sunday roast. Yeah. So it's quite crunchy. If you think about the texture of, you know, of nuts and, and that sort of flavour, oh. that's very much what I what I would liken it to. Yeah. Okay. But they, they do come in, in flavours as well. So we've, we've had uh, uh, had a look at some garlic and, and chilli roasted uh, crickets. Um, and I guess one thing we're interested in the study is would the idea of um, the presentation make it more acceptable? So if we were to prepare, say, a flour um, and use a you know, high protein based flour made, made from you know, these roasted insects um, and use that to make biscuits and, and breads, does oh, that okay. make it more palatable that we're not actually looking, looking at? at the, yeah. Yes, I don't yes, think so I couldn't ever imagine myself picking up a cockroach and going, no, that but looks it really was, yummy. But, yeah, right. but at the same time, you don't put cow and steak together, really. That's right. You don't put chicken and chicken together, uh, running around the <laughs> farmyard and a chicken together, do you? That's right. We really don't. We forget about the process that happens in between. That's, that's exactly right. So, mm. you know, we're definitely interested to see if... if Providing you know insect-based you know protein in a in a form that we're more familiar with makes it more palatable and more appealing to consumers. We've probably all seen the documentaries in Asia with with deep-fried um, crickets and worms and grubs and things. Mm. Um, 
but people genuinely do eat that. I think we've sort of got a bit lost with sticking ants in lollies and things. That's it's right. the wrong way to look at this, haven't we? Yeah, certainly there's a novelty factor. So your chocolate coated, you know, insects or yeah, the, the insects or scorpions or ants in a, in a lollipop, you know, it's kind of cute and, you know, it's a bit, a bit novel, but we're actually approaching this, you know, from a, a very legitimate point of view because as, you know, traditional protein sources become more and more difficult for us to, to produce, um, insects, you know, farming of insects, you know, is a real... Well, um, the statistics viable. are enormous, though, aren't they? They you are. Because I, I've forgotten what the... Do you know the statistics, the statistics for a cow, for example? Because a cow produces an enormous amount of gas because they just eat grass. Mm -hmm. And so for that to be digested, there's acids and whatever's happening with the earth and there's gas and a out the back and so on with a cow. Yeah. But um, and, and it needs to eat an enormous amount of grass for that to turn into meat. But an insect is so small by comparison. That's right. The, the amount of feedstock and water I'm um, glad you used the proper words. <laughs> Thank you for that. Required to farm and produce one kilogram of protein from, from insects is much, much lower than what you need for the traditional you know, produce, so things like beef and, and pork and, and chicken. So there's definitely a, an environmental um, and sustainability um, benefits to, to the consumption of edible insects. Now, if we took away the word insect and turned it into seafood, we eat basically seafoody insects, but we don't think that they're just slightly bigger versions of what we've got that's on the right, land. That's right. If you, you think about the first person who ate a prawn or who ate a Morton Bay bug... And exactly. Yeah, so there, there are some, for me, some analogies there as, very, as well. Very, very, yeah. yeah, very clear and, and simple ones when you think Absolutely. about it. Um, so is it, is it... Do you think what's going to happen is we're going to start to breed bigger insects, like when we're talking about seafood? I'm just having this picture. <laughs> this is enormous Cockroach. Well, you know, that's all right. With its Sitting little in the middle of the table for <laughs> yeah. Christmas dinner. Oh, let's get it. Yeah, carve it. We'll be <laughs> so chunky you can carve it. It's fantastic. No, but yeah. do, do you think this is going to bring on that sort of thing? Because clearly a lot of the animals we, we've developed and bred to be more food uh, producing. Are we going to do that, do you think, with insects. Look that might be something to consider down the track um, I guess the efficiency of, of production mm. but um, for now I think the biggest hurdle is to get over the you know the consumer I guess what, what is really is the yuck factor. Um, if we can get people to accept um, insects as a, as a source of protein for consumption that's the first start mm. and then what we're interested in is, is also looking at um, what are some of the other benefits so can we take waste produce from other industries um, so the one that comes to mind for me might be grape marks, so the, the material left over after the winemaking process, or even left over, you know, food scraps or, you know, garden waste. Can these be diverted as, as um, the feedstock for edible insects? And so there are multiple, you know, benefits there. But also, what impact does it have on the nutritional content of the insects? Right. And also the, the taste and the, and the flavour and well, aroma. Well, we're sort of doing that mm. with pe pigs and pork That's right, to a degree we are. already. So it's not really a big step to go for the next no, one. No, no. For, for me, it's sort of the obvious direction for the research to head. Yes, how fantastic. What a great area to work in. Yeah, it's very interesting. Is this happening all over the world or is it just happening locally? Um, well, I actually got interested in this project as a result of a, a former French student who worked in my group and she's now involved in a, with a company in, in France that farms edible insects um, and we were talking about the project and uh, you know I started looking into it in, in Australia and found that actually there is a company that produces insects and um, there is already. so there is a bit of a market here yeah but but even if you know even if Australian consumers decide that it's not really for them we're so close to Asia that there's you know an of export course. market there for us as well so Sounds there's like lots a great of idea to get into for the future mm. absolutely uh, for everybody's sake quite frankly and listen when you're hungry you'll eat anything <laughs> apparently so and if the anything is if the anything is going to give you the nutrition you need, you know. I'm just thinking worm farm has a whole new meaning really. Doesn't adjust. Doesn't adjust. <laughs> oh, I can see you doing that. Worm farm. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm looking at that one. <laughs> that one for well, it's it's really about people understanding that this research is going on, mm -hmm. that in the future this could solve 
you know, really third world country. And you know, when the locust plague comes in, just catch, catch them. them and cook that's them. That's right. Might be a blessing in disguise. Exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly right. It's learning to understand what we've got to work with, I guess. Yeah. Um, look, that's just fantastic. Thank you so much really for interesting. joining us and, and talking about that. Thank you. Now, we'll be back in just a little while with some information about financial planning with John Grokey and Kim. Yes, stay with us. Well, those that have retired or are about to retire, we might be able to save you some money and, well, at least point you in the right direction. John Grody is a financial planner. John, welcome. I know you're an old hand Ken, at this. thank you. Um, things are changing rapidly, aren't they, for they people are. that are retiring? They are. I think uh, there have been recent changes for people that get part pension. Um, it's more difficult for people to be eligible for pension and that's going to change significantly from January 2017 yeah. where the new rules come in. So, so what should people be doing if, I mean, most people have got super quite clearly, but you, you, once you retire, you've got to change things. You've got, do you go more conservative? What, what do you do? I think it's interesting. It's going to vary depending on people's capability and, and what they've accrued for retirement. I think the big thing is they need to get some advice and make sure they've sat down with someone probably a, um, a good deal of time before they're actually retiring. When you say a good deal of time, what, a year, six think, months, two years? I think it would be ideal five years prior to retirement, but certainly really? three or more years. Yeah. And <clears throat> how do you know you're getting a good financial planner? I mean, we know you're a good financial <laughs> planner, but you, you <clears throat> cop a little bit of bad flack in the newspapers occasionally, in the press, don't yeah, you? We do. Um, I think... First of all, the, the, the guidance would be that they need to be a member of their association, the yep. Financial Planning Association. There's, there's some recognition of the fact that if they're a member there, they're supervised. Um, I also think that word of mouth goes a long way. If people are talking to friends, colleagues, people that have had a good experience, by and large, most financial planners are doing a great job. Mm. There have been an element, particularly around the... GFC some years ago where things weren't as they should have been and unfortunately that um, tires everyone in the industry. So <clears throat> make sure they're accredited and uh, do your homework, talk to other people? Generally, um, generally speaking accreditation is essential now for all financial planners but a chartered financial planner is, is a planner who's actually gone through a very rigorous program so that would be a starting point for those at the highest qualification level, but experience, years in the industry and word of mouth and recommendation from uh, your community is probably good. You'd be studying all the time. Every time you open the paper there's a change or a proposed change. Professional development is an ongoing thing and I think it is for, for most disciplines where um, ongoing education is part of the legislative environment. So changes occur all the time and I don't think that's going to slow down at all. For the better? Or do you sometimes, I was going to say uh, tear your hair but I wasn't, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> the hair's already gone. <laughs> um, <I've, laughs> I think some of it's for the better. A lot of it is um, actually imposing um, very stringent rules and, and uh, framework around which we have to operate in, so it's a highly regulated environment. Mm. <clears throat> if somebody is re retiring, how much do they need? I mean, are people retiring with enough money? It's a really good question because there's uh, a number thrown around quite often of a million dollars being the ideal number. Sounds a heck of a lot. But what people don't take into account necessarily is that for some of the people that are going to retire, they're going to get some age pension. And the age pension is probably for a couple just over $30,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So if you had to have the capital sitting in an investment somewhere or the bank, you'd have to have at least half a million dollars. So part of it is probably going to be paid by the government as a guaranteed pension. Mm, and and with, uh, with that, of course, you do get the dispensation, don't you, for health and uh, various other things, which there, is also... There are fringe money. benefits, and a lot of people feel that those benefits are quite important, and health's a very important one. It, it, it must be tough, as opposed to maybe 10, 15 years ago, when you put some money in the bank and you got a decent interest. Nowadays, you get 
very little. So the, where do uh, you put your money that when it's uh, to make sure it's safe? That that's probably an uh, even more appropriate question with uh, just the current environment, which is quite volatile at the moment. Mm. Interest rates are, are very very low historically, and probably not going to go up a lot in the short term. Mm. So the people that were relying on deposit, um, their deposit earning an interest and paying them an income are struggling. Well, it, it, it wouldn't be keeping in, uh, up with inflation, surely? Inflation's probably been pretty benign, so mm. it hasn't been the issue it has historically, but interest rates are certainly in some cases causing people to take on additional risk to try and seek higher income. Well, that in itself, looking at the uh, the stock market of late, is also a big worry. Yeah, it, it, look, it is. And Ken, I think the current environment is one that will concern everybody globally because it's very, uh, very uncertain and, un and uncertainty is not something that goes well with stock markets. If, if people came to you and said, John, what can I do? They're asking you specifically, what would you say to them? Or does that change month by month? I think it changes, it's something you've got to review. Um, there, there probably have been some signs that things are going to change and in those things changing, um, I think people need to make a decision about where they need to sit with their investments and probably the big thing is they need to ensure they've got enough liquidity to pay their pension or the income that they're drawing from the investments for a period of time so that all the uncertainty and the movement in their capital value for shares and the like don't actually alter their lifestyle. Somebody comes to you, what do you recommend? I mean, uh, I know it's a very broad question, but we hear horror stories of uh, some uh, companies taking it all in fees, taking, you know, people are not getting very much at all. Is that still fairly common or is it getting better? It's getting better. I think people who have had investments for a long time, whether it be superannuation or investments that aren't superannuation, need to consider or review what they have because there are offerings now that are certainly lower cost and probably the what's called legacy products or things that people have been in for 10 years or more might need to be updated because they're probably paying a bit more than they need to. Really? Wouldn't their advisor tell them, hey, we can do something better for you? Unfortunately, <coughs> often it's not the person who's getting regular advice that's sitting with that type of product. It's the people that haven't had advice for some years and uh, perhaps hadn't reviewed it and that's just sitting in the, uh, in the drawer and just uh, continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. <coughs> if you've got investments, you retire, do you necessarily have to change them because you can have medium risk, high risk? Do you go more conservative once you've re retired or should you? There are probably two parts to the answer to the question. One is that people who retire are often looking for income, therefore their investments need to be structured so that in part their income is being um, serviced and uh, helping them to um, live day to day. So the structure of their investments may change. Whether they're more conservative or not depends very much on how they feel and what they're trying to achieve. Because some people, if they have substantial resources, probably can take more risk. Um, other people will be more conservative because that's their nature. Yeah, so people should definitely, if, as you say, they're retiring in five years, should get advice and get somebody that they trust and they will hopefully point them in the right direction. I think, Ken, definitely. The other thing that can be added to that is there's an opportunity for people to consider prior to retirement actually accessing their superannuation. And you were mentioning that, yeah. <clears throat> it's called a transition to retirement pension. Is that um, wise though, John? I mean... It, it, I think the question is, do people really need to do it? Because one wouldn't take money out of superannuation if you don't need to. Correct. But it may be that people are looking to support their lifestyle and the spirit of the legislation that originally brought this in was I can work part time and I can have a bit of income from super to actually be in a similar position. But in, in a perfect world you would uh, you'd want to leave your money there if you possibly can? If you can. The other interesting twist to it is that if you have the ability to put money into superannuation before um, you retire in, the, in yeah. the years towards retirement it may be that you can benefit from 
the tax benefit of putting that in at 15 per cent. And if you're over 60, you can draw money from your superannuation as a pension tax free. Thank you, John. Good to talk with you. John Grokey. John is a uh, financial planner and hopefully he's helped us somewhat. Coming up shortly, Malcolm will be talking with Mark McBrady of Home Instead Senior Care. I think this is part two of top scams targeting older Aussies and there's a heck of a lot of them out there, trust me. That's what they say. And welcome back to our time, Mark McBrighty, who's the Managing Director of Home Instead Senior Care. We're going to talk about fishing. Excellent. Not the one with the line, although it can be a bit that way in a way. We're talking about fishing spelt with a PH. Indeed. And this is via your computer and the internet. Indeed, and it really is um, an outside organisation trying to, or an individual trying to find as much detail as they can about you, either to use your credit card details or indeed to use your identity for them to be able to borrow funds. So it is very important that quite often these um, fishing uh, expeditions will come from very well-known organisations. It might be banks. It might be that aren't real. That aren't real. No. Um, the ATO, um, particularly around this time yes, of year, the ATO is popular. Is a good one. Yeah, uh, that that aren't real. Um, the point is we've. If you use a computer every day like I do, we see them quite often. It's a matter of being smart because, again, if it came through your letterbox at home, you would ignore it or you'd be checking it. Indeed. You wouldn't just be clicking yes or whatever. Uh, and, again, we're not trying to frighten people with this because, again, the internet is the most wonderful tool. Um, the ability to pay your bills online is the most wonderful tool, but banks don't ask you for that information online, and neither does anybody else. Really. That's correct. I mean, at the end of the day, you should use a reputable PayPal or another provider to, uh, if you do need to transfer funds online, but certainly do not give your credit card details out for someone who said that they need to uh, update their, their client details of you from a bank. Um, if a bank requires that, they will send that via, um, via mail. They certainly won't be via email. Same thing with the phone, because you wouldn't be doing that with the phone either. Those stray calls that come from other places around the world asking for information. Absolutely. And again, you know, these are working on a dialer where they you know, work on one out of a thousand that will give them the information that they require. Um, you know, they only need your, your credit card details and your birth date, and they can have a, a marvellous shopping expedition. So you need to be very, very mindful of who you give the information out to. But of course there are um, a lot of people... Um, who can honestly pay online and provide that service for you in exactly the right way. And they're the organisations that are well established that you know this is the method of doing it. It's not some strange thing. A woman said to me the other day after I'd taken down all her credit card details, that's what I was trying to avoid, to give those on the phone. And as I said to her, when you put your credit card into a machine, that's exactly the same. But you're buying something that we all understand is legitimate. So if you don't know the people, you don't know the organisation, even if you do and it's a bank, say no. Say no. And if you've got any doubt, ring the bank and check the validity of that uh, email and see if they did in fact send That's it. That's the best advice. Thanks, Mark. Come back and tell us some more. I shall do. Jam-packed today. <laughs> I'm, yeah, not, still not sure. About the insects? <laughs> What about the fishing on the internet? Well, that's true. That's, there's a, we, we're running a few of segments and, and he's coming back to talk to us on a regular basis about things that we need to know about, not to be afraid of, but just to be aware of. Yes, very important. I got today, somebody wants to give me, through Microsoft even, wants to give me, a, a won $10 million. <laughs> well, you know that's not true because that ain't going to happen. <laughs> that just came through on an email oh, today. Oh, really? Looks so official and you just know that's not true. crazy, crazy, crazy. True. But, you know, using the internet for things like Facebook is great because you can find out what's on the program and we can talk to each other. Do you know we're on YouTube too? If you've missed a program that you would like to watch, then find us on YouTube. Yeah, and what, that'll be there forever. So until next time on Our Time, keep yourself nice. Till then. Till then. Bye.